Hey, everybody, welcome to this week's edition of the DMZ America podcast for April 17th, Wednesday, it's 2024. I'm Scott Stantis, editorial cartoonist coming to you from the right distance from my pal Ted. Very distant, but not emotionally or sexually. Um, it is <laughs> well sexually, <laughs> yes. Uh, and I'm Jesus. editorial cartoonist Ted Rall coming to you from the left. Uh, I would say hello, everybody, but there's certain people that I don't want to say hello to. So hello to almost everybody. Wow. Well, we'll have to learn who those other people are in just a Looking moment. Look at you, Austin Buettner. Anyway, all right, bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to tell you, last week, if you listened to and or watched the podcast, which my wife did and said we sounded great, which is, you know, high praise. Okay. Um we were actually in the same room. We're in we're in Ted's studio in his palatial New York apartment. And um what the hell? Where was I going with this? We um where was I going with this, Ted? Something about <laughs> the love of Clovis or <laughs> the love of campaign buttons. Listen, I am suffering. I, Ted came down with what we thought was allergies, maybe a flu. Now I have the allergies, which makes me think it's the flu. So if there's you know the all of this gets a little muddy. And there is a flu anyway, going around to make it all confusing, yeah. Yes. So what I was going to get at is when we went out to a couple of bars, um, we talked about the uh, pro-Palestinian protests and the uh, what's going on in Gaza. And Ted and I, as you may know, disagree on this issue a lot and fairly passionately. Ted maybe more passionately than I do, but that's, you know, that's just Ted. Well, you know, I mean, Being Ted. It's, I, I, I get irritable when it's like <laughs> tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians being murdered just for fun uh, in a disgusting land grab. So, yeah. Well, I'm not sure it it's for fun. But um, so anyway, so we're going to there are a couple of issues that we're going to tackle. But in the one that it's the uh, the uh, Val Victorian for USC, a uh, Muslim American. Uh, they d canceled her speech, um, which I, mean, I have a serious issue with, and I know Ted does probably for very different reasons, but connect that with the pro-Palestinian protests sweeping across the America and campuses. And Ted just mentioned before we started recording what's going on at Columbia, and maybe you want to fill in our listeners real quick. Yeah, right about near, that. So, so Columbia University uh, became the, the fourth of the uh, Ivy League colleges after MIT UPenn and Harvard. I don't know actually, actually if MIT is technically in the Ivy League, but I mean, they might as well be. Um, they, uh, but anyway, these highly elite schools um, that is uh, the president is up there on Capitol Hill testifying about alleged anti-Semitism on college campuses, specifically her own. Um, and at the same time, uh, tensions are very, very high back on campus. Uh, currently, even as we speak, um, the uh, the pro-Palestinian students have decided to occupy the central lawn um, of the uh, campus, which is sort of a very contained campus not far from where I live on the uh, in Manhattan. It, that's up on the upper upper west side called Morningside Heights. Um, there's talk about like maybe a repeat of the Columbia 1968 student uprising when students took over the entire campus or most of it uh, before the police uh, came in and and they called it the bust. Um, but anyway, that's yeah, that, that's pretty out there. Um, and of course, also there were those uh, major protests. Yeah, uh, I guess that happened Monday um, when there were uh, simultaneous unannounced protests that shut down the um, Golden Gate Bridge uh, connecting San Francisco to Marin County in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Brooklyn Bridge here in New York City, um, the, appro the approach road to O'Hare Airport in Chicago and four other major cities all had simultaneous protests that were also aimed at shutting down infrastructure. So all that's going on. Well, let me ask you right out of the bat, Ted, do, I mean, do the students at Columbia have the moxie to occupy today? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm being a, serious. That's a good fucking question. So, and, and I have some, uh, a little bit of insight that's very out of date, but more recent than 1968. So um, in the mid 80s, uh, Columbia University was the uh, target of students like me who protested their policy vis-a-vis -vis what was then apartheid era South Africa and called for divestiture of, uh, um, of, of the uh, very large multi-billion dollar portfolio of 
of Colombia um, out of South African stocks. Um, there were protest demonstrations planned. I was part of this. I was on the steering committee to uh, discuss the possible occupation of Hamilton Hall, which is the main administrative building for Columbia College. Um, and long story short, um, they decided that I was out. I was outvoted. Um, I wanted to rock it old school, and we were going to like lock ourselves inside and like not let the cops come in and get us and do anything necessary to resist until we got all arrested. Um, that was like too that was that was a little too rough for my colleague for my my fellow students they were like no 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 we'll lock ourselves outside so what that looked like is they they camped outside it should be pointed out it was january and this is pre-climate oh, change yeah. so it was freezing fucking cold and i mean it was like 10 degrees out i mean that would never happen now now it'd be 70 but like the point is that like <laughs> you know and, and so it was like it's it was it was a problem and i was like so they they locked the doors to the building uh, which allowed administrators to come and go using steam tunnels underneath the 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 the, um, the campus uh, that connect to other buildings. So the the building essentially was in business, but the doors front doors were locked. It was still, I, as I pointed out, illegal because it violated the fire code. So there was cause to be arrested, except that okay. you're arrested and you know cold. Um, I was like, we could be arrested and you know warm. And um, and, then they, and so and then finally there was this. What finally caused me to break this all down, uh, and I I went my separate ways from them, was when they said, okay, we're going to cooperate with the NYPD, and fill out forms so that we can be quickly arrested and processed in and out of the twenty sixth precinct without having to you know spend more than an hour, an hour and a half in the booking process. We won't have to spend the night in the lockup, but down at the tombs or anything like that. And I was like. Steve Biko didn't get processed easily by the South African police. Nelson Mandela didn't, you know, he had some injuries. No. And I was like, <laughs> you guys are frankly yes. a bunch of cowards and I can't be part of this. And so I doubt that today's students are braver than we were. <laughs> I could be wrong, but there has been no sign so far on, in any of these demonstrations that show that um, the modern left, including the pro-Palestine uh, liberation movement is um, more willing to engage, you know, mix it up with the police or with um, anyone else if need be. And, you know, look, good for them. They can stay nonviolent, whatever. But the point is violence isn't always um, useful, but, you know, it's like, I, you know, occupying, does require the willingness to confront to possibly become the victim of violence. And right. I don't know if they're that brave. Well, I think even beyond that, and you and I have talked about this on the podcast before, so we're not really going on new territory, but just the fact that the protests, remember the women's movement was going to women's marches, we're going to march every month against Donald Trump for his entire administration. That happened once. No, no, that's once not and true. One, one and a half. One and it a half. happened one and a half times. That's right. <laughs> okay. So they that didn't go forward. The million mile march against for gun for you know against gun violence for gun control laws happened once. Um it didn't have was, a million moms. I think it was a pretty big turnout, but it was don't you know, ever one big... call your call don't ever call yourself a million unless you have at least a million. <laughs> you okay. know what I mean? Is that is that, that the just rule? be like lots of moms? <laughs> <laughs> Many no, moms, some mucho, moms. mucho moms, the moms um, that were the moms who showed up. But the protests that all these protests are supposed to go on now, frankly, um, the the, the pro Palestinian stuff has been happening with more regularity than I expected. Quite frankly, uh, it's, it's lasted at more least, than a, uh, twice a week. I would say on average, right? So substantial. Th this is a sustained. Um, this is a sustained protest movement, something that you don't see very often. Right. Well, we haven't seen at all. And now well, let's we, see. we did. We saw Black Lives Matter after the killing. This is true. George You're right. Floyd. You're yeah. right. And that and that was more and more consistent. And that led to nothing happening. Correct. That's right. Um, which shocks me because they, I think their point was well taken that 
changing people. Killing, un, like strangling unarmed people for, for bullshit reasons is not that's, good. Yeah. That's that's a bad thing. Shooting someone like they did at Laquan McDonald in Chicago, uh, seven, show up at a scene for less than six seconds and start opening fire. Stuff like that is bad. I think we mm -hmm. might, many of us can say, this is bad. Tacky, <laughs> gauche. Tacky. Gauche, gauche to the extreme. But in all seriousness, reimagining policing in America, which had become so militarized and so confrontational that clearly something has to be done and nothing's been done. I mean, they've talked about it. Chicago's one area. Uh, Minneapolis that talked, talked about. about completely defunding their cops. Right. That's stupid. a hot second. And then, you know, poof. well, it's dull. It's also a dumb idea um, because, well, for obvious reasons, but so Okay, let's let's segue with this to the USC University of Southern California validate Victorian um, Muslim American woman. She was going to give a speech. They they canceled the speech for reasons that they will not say why, other than security reasons. They're getting some crazy ass dipshits from around the country saying, "I what I'm for the UP of Michigan, and I don't like this." Um, you know, which you get from everything now. So you can't really respond to it in a serious way. But this is um, the the woman whose name I don't have in front of me, but she has said that she doubts that these were the kinds of threats that should have precluded her speech. And frankly, they should have given her the option. Asna Tabosum. And she should have been given the option. They should say, listen, we're getting, here's here's full disclosure. And they haven't even disclosed to her what the threats were, the nature of them, or how seriously they, they were, uh, which I find disgusting. You, you and I agree on transparency. If, if you're going to tell me you can't do something because there's a security threat, you better damn well tell Ted Rawl or Scott Standis what the threat is. First and foremost, if it's serious, we have family. We don't want them hurt. And, you know, almost equally as important, we don't want us hurt. <laughs> so, so, so you have to tell her what the threats were. They did not tell her what the threats were. That's because there were none. I think no. There's always threats. Ted, no, you I mean, and I draw, are there a is, I'm sorry. There is literally no threat that could possibly. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you had a credible threat that the state of Israel was going to send a nuclear weapon to blow up mm -hmm. Los Angeles to stop her speech. That's not a reason to cancel the speech. There can be no reason to cancel that speech. There is no it. acceptable reason. There is no, re I don't care if they say, really? you know, that there's gunmen coming, then you hire security for that. I mean, you're going to need it anyway, right? You're right. Like, exactly. Whether the speech takes place or not. So, I mean, the point is you just can't live that way. Um, this, the only way to read this is that the, is that USC took a Zionist pro-Israel anti-Palestinian position on this on on the middle eastern conflict and they can say and i don't know what happened in that in that room and it may that may never have happened at all or cross the lips or even the or, or or even the synapses of any of the people in the decision making loop here that doesn't matter you made that decision effectively that's the decision you've made it, it is completely unacceptable for a zillion reasons not the least of which is she's the valedictorian she gets a ticket as valid yeah. as the person who did the best work and studying out of her class at a very big school. She has the right to give a fucking speech. And I don't care if she goes out there and says, kill all the Jews, blow up the state of Israel. Um, she, this is America. You can say that. Everyone else can say if she says something wrong or bad, that she's wrong or bad. But the point is that she, she has the right to give a speech. She should give that speech. No one should censor her speech. What they did is absolutely, absolutely repugnant, disgusting, um, indefensible, and they should be absolutely ashamed of her themselves. I hope she sues them, and I think she will prevail because this is, I think, um, I think it's state censorship. I mean, I know USC is a private institution, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if this kind of directive came from the U.S. government, from like. The Department of Homeland Security, or something like that. I'm going to be more. I'm going to be more cynical than that, Ted. I, uh, which is out cynicking Ted Rawl is tough. 
but I think it came from, you touched on it for a second, a, a moment ago, and that is that a large uh, base for their fundraising, mm. which you and I talked about. I mean, by the way, folks, this tone and tenor of Ted talking like this, this is what we had in bars in new york last week oh yeah <laughs> but they uh the largest I, I i'm not sure if they're the largest but they have to rank certainly near the top 10 uh, uh contributions to usc is from the jewish community in southern california in fact ted and i talked about this over drinks again uh when uh spielberg and george lucas gave a substantial contribution to colleges both of those guys were not accepted into USC. They went to Long Beach State, where I went for a short period of time, and they did not give the money to Long Beach State. They gave it to USC because that's where you're supposed to give a lot of money. They have a large endowment, as sort of very much like Columbia, very much like Harvard, very much like Yale, billions of dollars. They don't need the money, but somewhere along the line, a contributor or a handful of contributors, very powerful, uh, wealthy contributors who... Uh, uh, support Israel came to them and said, "You got it. no, no, just no," and you can't allow that to happen. Listen, I, you know, I'm pro-Israel, and Ted is pro-Palestinian. Although I think we both there's a middle ground that we can both meet on this one, and I believe that we can and have. But regardless of that, I am a First Amendment guy, and I lived in the friggin' United States of America where we have a goddamn First Amendment. And you don't get threatened. And if you do get threatened, you say, fuck you. And you give right. the speech anyway. But Correct. that's not what Correct. happened here. And also, and and it is, it's an, and, and that's really the point, Scott. What I'm about to say is just a side issue, a side note. Um, but side notes are sometimes worth hearing. Andrew Guzman, he's the provost at USC. Uh, he said that um, this was in order to prevent substantial security risks. Um, he said uh, and then he was asked by reporters, local reporters there at WABC TV out there in Los Angeles, um, that which, by the way, I appreciate a great deal because they were actually they did really strong reporting on the Los Angeles Times issue with me at the time. Um, anyway, uh, WABC asked if there had been any actual threats, and he said no. There's been what? No what? Threats. He said we, no. No, he said no. We can't ignore the fact that similar risks have led to harassment and even violence at other campuses is all he had to say. The intensity of feelings fueled by both social media and the ongoing conflict have grown to include many voices outside of USC and has escalated to the what point- What does that even creating, mean? In that other words, something. it's like literally saying, we're gonna puss out, there's been no threats whatsoever. Um, we're just gonna puss out maybe because of our alums or maybe because of like groups on campus that are pro-Israeli, like. Trojans for Israel, which is, I'm going to just say is a, an unfortunate name, <laughs> 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 like, like in fact, <laughs> Trojans is an unfortunate name. It is. Um, yes. You know, but anyway, because I, I have a certain <laughs> visual there, but yes. um, anyway, it says, um, the so the, the a spokesperson for Trojans for <laughs> Israel, I'm going to say that many, many times, Vice President Ella Echo said because it says that the uh the, the lady who was gonna who's the valedictorian in her bio she states that she calls for the abolition of the state of israel which is completely anti-semitic and that makes us jewish students at usc feel unsafe unheard and targeted um ella i'm going to speak slowly and use small words you're not you don't have any right to feel safe from words no one has a right to feel safe from words, because this is America. Also, you are heard because you're able to be interviewed by WABC TV, but also it's not your time to be heard. If you wanted to be heard, you should have been valedictorian. It's her turn to be heard. And in terms of targeted, that's bullshit. And also calling for the abolition of the state of Israel is not anti-Semitic. So- well you know you and i disagree on that but that's another that's another podcast that's absurd that's like absurd on the for face the of it i just of the of the of vatican city as a separate nation state that does not make me catholic anti catholic it just it does, doesn't make you pro catholic it, does, it no it doesn't it doesn't do anything it has it doesn't speak to whether how i, I think feel it, about catholics at all i think it does and we need beers in front of us to have that conversation but that's um i i agree with you in your assessment of what this is, Ted, because this is 
this is just wrong. This made me yeah. sick when I when I saw it. Yeah, I mean, this this young, p- powerful, beautiful, smart woman who is like her parents are going to come and see yeah. her. Yeah, and, and she immigrant has, pa- immigrant parents, by the way, and they're I taking mean, and the USC is taking a huge shit on her, on the Palestinian community, on Muslims in general. Um, if you talk about unheard and and like I don't want to, oh keep, yeah, but like talk yes, about I would have to been agree. Censored. This is bullshit. I would agree completely. Let's segue down to then another Israel issue: the Israel Iran conflict. I'm not sure what the hell to call it. Um, Israel bombs and kills uh, Iranians in the Iranian consulate in including Syria, the top general. including the top general. Iran then says we're going to reciprocate. They launched a fuck ton of, of uh, missiles and drones, all of which were shot down by Israel, United States, Jordan, and uh, Saudi Arabia. France. And with, with no France damage. And in the UK. France. In the UK, so no damage caused to Israel. Well, now that's not Israel... quite true. There was a young, there was a young girl. I believe she was seven years old, a Bedouin girl who suffered uh, pretty serious injuries from. Okay. Uh, um, I guess I don't know if it was a missile or a drone missile. So one of the missiles got through that, but but for the most part, it was a non-event. And now Israel is saying, is saying, what, we're we're still considering what our response will be. And just going, okay, that's escalation. You had your say. You killed Iranians. They had their say. They injured an Israeli. Now, stop it. Just knock that shit off. I well, mean, you've what, already got one more. And other Americans advised. Pres- the president asked Bibi Netanyahu to um, take the win. You won. You, you repelled yeah. this attack. Of course, you know, it was meant to be repelled. That's why it was announced uh, days in advance. Yeah, let me ask you, I mean, because you have been to that region many times, and I defer to your wisdom, and because you've talked to people in those areas, you... Um, and I've been you know, to Iran. I, and you've been to Iran, and um, partied with Iranians. I have. I have, actually. I gotta tell um, you, those are wild parties. No kidding. Not yeah, no that, kidding. I've, I've heard the details, and our, our listeners don't need to. No. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what I still can't get my head around what Iran hoped to achieve. Did they know that all their missiles and drones would be shot down? They hoped that they would all be shot down. Um, so what's the point? Because Israel, here's the thing. I, Israel has Iranian blood on their hands true. from the attack in Syria. That may, so they purposefully, consciously went against after... The, against the sovereign soil of Iran because... They blew up a consulate. A consulate right. is Iranian soil. So Iran responds this way, which seemed to me, I don't know how else to put this, Ted, a really wussy, weird way. We talked about it when it happened because I just left New York and then the attacks, the, the, the attack from Iran happened. And my question to you then was, what's going on? You felt this was fodder for the Arab street. I'm not sure this nourishes that in any way. Well, it, it, not much, but I think it, look, here's what I think happened. The, 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 first of all, the Iranians are extremely careful people, and that includes the, the rulers of the Islamic Republic. Um, they've been beleaguered for a long time. They've been suffering from U.S. trade sanctions. Don't forget the pressure that they've been under geopolitically, being squeezed on both major borders with Afghanistan and Iraq by U.S. occupations that lasted for decades. Um, so, you know, imagine if, if the, imagine if like, say, you know, China occupied Canada and Mexico at the same time, we'd be like, oh, you know, we'd be feeling the squeeze, right? So they, the Iranians have, have been, um, they're very measured and very tempered people. And so they decided, look, we can't let this pass. We've let too many things pass. We let the murder of Soleimani by Trump in Iraq go um, we're, we're not going to let this, 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 like, we can't let this go, or the Iranian people are going to think we're pusses. So, but we can't, we also don't want to escalate this and turn it into World War III. We don't want a hot war with the Israelis. So how do we get them to fuck off and leave us alone? And so they came up with this solution. It's a show of strength. It's like they sent over 300 drones and cruise missiles over, but they warned about it. 
And so what's the implication? Well, with plenty of warning, days of warning of when and how it was going to take place, of course, they could almost all be shot down. But next time, there might not be a warning. Next time, the Iranian Air Force might directly fly over Jordan and Iraq over to Israel and bomb Israel itself directly. Um, they have a real air force. Um, you know, it's like, so yeah. it's kind of, it's basically like saying, look, stop fucking with us. This is a shot across their bow. It's like, we, we, we're going to make a big show of strength, but it's, they're all duds effectively. Well, in fact, the Iranians over the, over last night. Okay. And I just, I, I question why do a performative act when the other side has already stabbed you effectively? Because they don't want to escalate. Okay, but, they, words, but, but last night and this morning, they, they said they had, you know, obviously news conferences and stuff saying, Israel, you, if you respond to this, then you ain't seen nothing. Then you're just going to get it again. Well, but, that's right. And I don't know what that means. I mean, obviously, one of the big problems in any kind of military conflict, you know, where they say it's diplomacy by other means, right? But it's also, but it isn't really, because what happens is when communications break down to the point where you're firing projectiles at each other, like we see in Russia and Ukraine, it means that you're not, you don't understand each other even well enough to disagree like the way you and I do, mm. where we, we can talk. I mean, I think if you and I talk about almost anything, like, you know, like, I think I have a pretty good sense, for example, of, you know, why you support Israel. And, and like, I could make that argument. I could, well, why does Scott feel the way he does? I can, I can explain that. I can get into your head. I think you have a pretty good sense. You could do the same thing with me. Yeah, I think we so. We both know where we're coming from. If you, if you can't get there through communications, that's where things break down and you go into fuck you mode. Well, the problem is the Israelis and the Iranians do not get each other at all. And mm. like the, um, and I think there's probably Iranians within the intelligence community who do understand Israel and vice versa. But overall, the leadership doesn't get each other. And the, the Israelis miscalculated. They thought, mm. you know, it, it's sort of like if you think of Pearl Harbor, why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? They didn't think we were going to declare war. They didn't think, they thought it was a warning. They thought because Hawaii wasn't a state that we viewed it as a far flung colony that we really wouldn't care. We'd be like, oh shit, yeah. okay, we'll leave them alone. It was a cultural misunderstanding. Um, I think this is the same sort of thing. The Iran, the Iranians, the Israelis had kind of gotten used to we can hit the Israelis, the Iranians whenever we want, and nothing will happen. The Iranians are like, okay, well, we want to disabuse you of that, yeah, of that assumption. Um, so now when the Iranians come back and say, okay, next time we're really going to mean it, the question is, how do you interpret that? I interpret that as next time there will be an Iranian Air Force direct attack against Israel. But I could be wrong. That could they could mean something completely different. No, I think no, I think if 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 Israel attacks Iran again in the way that it attacked it in Syria, no question in my mind, Iran then will do what Iran has to do. And that is then 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 it becomes a hot war. Then the it becomes because I mean, the Israeli I mean look, the Israelis have been have been extremely provocative with the Iranians. And the Iranians have, they've played like they've kind of, the Israelis have been like the small yippy dog at the dog run who's biting the leg of the Great Dane who's looking down like, what are you doing? And then, but sometimes the Great Dane gets grouchy and he has to bite back. That's what's well, happened. I, I, okay. We're going to say that with, with support of Hamas, of, of Hezbollah, it's attacks. In, well, that's, and it's, that's the Israeli argument. The Israeli argument is like, well, I think it's too, reasonable. You, you Iranians are too cute by half. You think you can like wage war against us all the time through your proxies and that you guys are insulated from any kind of payback. Fuck yeah. you. We're coming for you. That's their that's their point of view. Yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree with it. So that's so, so, I, so and it's not it they're they're both not wrong. <laughs> and on that on that note that they're both not wrong. But by the way, I do want to just click quickly say to my uh, lefty friends in the Palestinian liberation movement, stop blocking bridges stop blocking airports you're losing hearts and minds i mean yeah. i was thinking about like they blocked the golden gate bridge for five fucking hours okay so there's old dudes who are like 60 years old and draw cartoons and they can't hold <laughs> their piss for five fucking hours okay like like i'm not even kidding or like what about kids people had babies like in their car 
and they can, their baby can't sit in the car for five fucking hours might not have enough food might yeah but doesn't this fall diapers. doesn't this fall into the ted rawl if protests are bullshit unless they cause discomfort at the very least yes and they should absolutely cause discomfort but not to people who are blameless this is like san francisco like they they have this thing called critical mass where the bicyclists go at rush hour and block rush hour traffic trust me having been in the i i'm a bicyclist trust me having been in a car when that happened all i thought was these people are assholes it's like you know go and inconvenience the powers that be go and block the street outside of the israeli consulate make it so that they can't yeah. come and go um you know don't block and don't like literally harm innocent civilians which is what you're doing here like i mean come on people going to o'hare who had to get out of the air, uh, you know, and and lug their luggage like two and a half miles to go and try to catch their flight. And if they don't catch it, then they, you know, get canceled. They have to pay two hundred dollars in 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 rescheduling fees. They miss important appointments. There are people probably going to see a dying relative. Cut the shit. You're being assholes. This is not the way resistance works. Resistance is targeted against the powers that be, not against innocent civilians. Well, and speaking of sixty year olds who have to pee. I'm going to cut this short now. We're going to end this segment right now. Okay. You're, list you're listening to the DMZ America podcast. I'm Scott Stantis, editorial cartoonist, coming to you from the right. And I'm Ted Rall, editorial cartoonist, coming to you from the left. And we'll be back with more right after this. And as promised, we're back. I'm Scott Stantis, editorial cartoonist, coming to you from the right. And I'm Ted Rall, editorial cartoonist, coming to you from the left. So Trump on trial, apparently um, the, the former president fell asleep during the proceedings. You've been through court proceedings, Ted. I don't, I don't suspect at all. No, I, I hear they're horribly drudgery. I've never really experienced it. So anyway, so he's yeah. So now it's he's being um, tried for giving money to a porn star to shut her up. I don't know that that's a crime. I certainly don't think it's a crime that's going to send anybody to jail. Maybe I'm wrong. Ted, I mean, this be. is. The Dem the Republicans and many of Trumpy and MAGA world are saying this is this is just the you know lawfare, which I think is kind of a clever name for it. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what this is? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very bad look for Democrats. Um, you know, I mean, you have a DA Alvin Bragg here in Manhattan who decided to uh, launch the first ever criminal prosecution of a former president of the United States on the flimsiest most trivial possible charge um, using a legal argument that is dubious as hell. I mean, here's, I mean, the thing is, Scott, you have to go through a lot of uh, logical leaps to get there, right? So Trump paid $130,000 to Stormy to get her to shut the fuck up. He gave the money. To, so what happened was um, Michael Cohen, his attorney, forwarded the money, then said, hey, Don, give me, pay me back the 130. Don said, sure, but I don't want anyone, anyone to know this was hush money. I said, can we make it look like you just billed me and issue me a fake invoice mm. for legal fees? He's like, yeah, sure, whatever. So we'll make that legal expenses. So there's no allegation that Donald Trump di dipped into his legal, into his campaign funds in order to do this. It's his own personal money, no, no question about that. Um, then, ironically, he could legally use campaign funds to spend on legal expenses, uh, as him and Biden are now doing in this cycle. But right. he didn't do that. So um, Alvin Bragg, who ran on, he, when he ran for office, promised to get Donald Trump, um, he came up with this very arcane um, thing. So basically, um, under campaign finance law, the argument is that effectively this payoff was a campaign expense because it took place shortly before the 2016 election. And it was meant in part, not just to keep her quiet and telling Melania and everyone else what he, and just embarrassing him, but also to improve his chances of winning the White House. This is a pretty, this is some pretty weak tea to begin with. And it's so weak that when it was, this, when uh, John Edwards, who did the same exact thing, was tried for it in 2012 by the federal government, the case fell apart. Um, the the jury uh, rejected one case, and all the other count all the other counts they were hung on. He wasn't convicted of anything. Uh, the DOJ, in fact, considered this case against Trump, and they said, "Look at what happened with Edwards. 
this isn't winnable. This is like bullshit. It's like, you know, it's not a felony. Right? So, so let me stop you right there and so, just inquire because I'm a little lost. What is he being charged with exactly? So violation of federal campaign law. But none of the money came from the campaign. No, it did not. It literally, it's like, a, it's just like basically like f- misreporting, like fucking around with like your reports, basically like, like rejiggering some shit that kind of doesn't really matter. That's really true what happened. And so he, um, and so then Alvin Bragg comes in, he's a local prosecutor, bear in mind the campaign finance law is a federal law. And so he, the, he his, his complicated scheme says that in New York, if you miss, if you do commit a wire transaction with the intention of committing a crime, that that be kind of rises from a misdemeanor to a felony, and not only that, uh, there's no we can you can as soon as you discover it is when the is when the clock starts to tick, not when the crime occurred. So even though normally the statute of limitations would have like killed this years ago, um, it's like we can revive it because we just literally figured out how to charge it. That's literally the argument. I mean. I don't think that the, I don't think this New York jury is going to convict. Um, I don't think they're going to convict Trump. I don't know if it'll be a hung jury or if it'll be a 12 angry men scenario or or they just throw the whole thing out unanimously. More likely that I don't think this is going to work. I think it's too there's too many giant leaps that you're asking a jury to do. Um, and it's just it's not even a factor of like whether you like Donald Trump or not or whether you think he, I mean, the thing is, it's just like, there's kind of like no crime. Right. And I think too, here's what I find. It's a technicality. It's a ticket. It's like, it's like right. someone in prison for 20 years for like double parking. Having been involved in politics, this sort of shit happens all the time, especially post-mortem because campaigns are hectic, crazy things. And so paperwork gets thrown around everywhere and, oh shit, I forgot to file this paper. I forgot to file these reports. And they get, you know, if it does get to rise to the level of criminality, which it almost never does, it's almost always handled with a fine and everyone goes their separate ways. But what bothers me, Ted, and what you talked about here is that Alvin Bragg ran on a platform. It's a selective office. Am I correct in assuming correct. that? Mm-hmm. And he this ran on a platform like, of prosecuting Trump. like Letitia James. Letitia other, James, you, Fonny, Fonny Willis, Fonny Willis Fonny, in Georgia. They all ran on platforms that they were going to prosecute a human being. Now, listen, I, I'm no fan of Donald Trump's. Ted is no fan of Donald Trump's. No. Believe me, we both find him repulsive and repugnant. But here's the thing, folks, and this is why this sort of thing should matter to you, is it can happen to you. Yes. All of a sudden, the Justice Department can turn on a dime and say, you know, and the prosecutors can run and say, I'm going to prosecute Ted Rawl. Yep. And I want you to yep. vote for me because I'm going to do that. And that's so, so contrary, so dangerous, so contrary to the American, the idea of American jurisprudence and, and justice. I mean, here's, the, here's the thing. I mean, if look at Donald Trump, I mean, whether or not he's guilty of a crime, I know not. Right. But but what is but what is true is that, like, imagine you're him. And you know, and you hear that a a DA candidate running to say, "I'm going to prosecute him," and you're like, "What? Really? That's like your..." And then he's voted in, and then he does that. I mean, you can't yeah, really sure blame Donald Trump or like let's just call him John Smith. You can't blame John Smith for saying they're out to get me. I mean, they are out to get him. I mean, yeah, just because- if if you're not out to if that's not out to get you, that that phrase doesn't mean anything. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. And that's this is one of the You don't even have to be paranoid here. They said no. they were out to get you. Yeah, they ran on a platform of so that 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 is so deeply disturbing. I, I think we just wanted to use this. It should be to, illegal. It should be. And, and here's the, the other thing is I mean, just the case itself, if it's true that no campaign funds were used, then that's bullshit right there. But the other thing is, if Ted, you know, I said I spent a week with Ted last week and a few days at his apartment, and I want him to shut up about what happened there. Shut up about what? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> and that ten that ten dollars was well spent. Um, what ten dollars? <laughs> my point is that 
is is that in its uh, in and of itself a crime? And it it just isn't. And this doesn't rise to that level. You know and... what this is like? It's very much like what happened to former New York Governor Elliot Spitzer. New York, you know, he hired a prostitute, didn't want anyone to find out, so he didn't get charged with you know hiring a prostitute, which is illegal. Um, what happened is he got he got charged with. Um, wire fraud, I believe it was, because he um, he sent the money through a fake bank account to the hooker or her, the hooker's agency. I mean, come on, really? I mean, it's like, I mean, if there's a crime here, it's the fact that he was like, you know, doing it with a hooker while he was married. I mean, that's not even really a crime. Uh, the hooker part's a crime, but it's a minor crime. So they basically decide to bootstrap this you know, the attempt to cover up your minor yeah. crime with another minor crime, you know, come on. And, and how did that trial turn out? Oh, um, you know, that's a good question. I actually don't think he was ever, I think they decided to drop the charges, but he was forced to resign as governor of New York, which is and, really too bad because he would, he was an excellent governor. Well, on that note, uh, we will shut down this particular segment of the DMZ America podcast. When we come back, other stuff. Okay. Other Promise. stuff. Stay tuned. And welcome back to the third and final segment of the DMZ America podcast. I'm Scott Stantis coming to you from the right. And I'm Ted Rall coming to you from the left. So the economy seems to be in a growing campaign issue. The Biden White House keeps telling us that uh, inflation is not so bad. But when you go out for dinner or a cup of coffee, uh, that puts a lie to that idea. And now the Biden administration, because they're tough on somebody, have decided to be tough on China. And they're applying, they're tripling the tariffs on Chinese steel and aluminum. aluminum. And it's just... Um, you know, if you're going to fight inflation, tripling, uh, you know, the price of a commodity that many people use and many industries use is may not be the best approach. Um, Ted, I, 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 tariffs always piss me off anyway. You, you as a student of 19th century presidential politics know tariffs were a huge issue. That's We didn't have income taxes. That's, right. That's how the United States government made money. We put tariffs on this and that. Various candidates ran, Republicans, Democrats ran it saying, well, I'm going to cut tariffs, I'm going to raise tariffs, you know, one way or the other. This does, and in fact, the tariffs did impact the function of the economy, even in the 19th century. By doing this, is Biden being stupid er? Um, you know, in general, I'm a protectionist. Uh, I believe in protecting American jobs and, and, and domestic industries from foreign depredation. Um, the American steel industry absolutely should have been protected with, uh, pro with uh, tariffs against imported Japanese steel during the 1980s uh, when the Japanese dumped the steel below uh, below the market price, below the price that they needed to break even, just in order to drive the American industry out of business. Go to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. You'll see what it looks like afterwards. Um, and they wanted to, uh, and and it, it succeeded, right? They didn't do that. This was under um, Ronald Reagan, uh, and he was not a protectionist. He was a free trader. And, um, and so as a result, I, I might argue a free traitor in, to American jobs. Ah, I see what case. you did there. Yes. And, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was, it was bad. There's a place and a time. This is a typical example of classic Biden of closing the barn door after all the horses have run away many, many decades ago. Um, the steel industry wasn't just gutted financially in the 80s. It never came back. It rotted away. And in fact, right now, pending before the um, the the, uh, the Biden administration under as for possible antitrust action is this pending merger acquisition by Nippon Steel, which is of course a Japanese company of U.S. Steel, the biggest steel company in the country. So in other words, the U.S. the biggest the U.S. American steel market is finished. So effectively, here's the grand irony: Joe Biden's going to protect the Japanese steel industry. Again, here in the U.S. against the Chinese. That's what he's doing. Really. I mean, it's so fucking stupid. I mean, you know, if it was 1981, I'd be all about it. But it's like, 
you know, who cares at this point? You're not, you know, I mean, yes, it'll, I guess you're protecting some American jobs, uh, but, you know, the steel jobs that are left here are few and far between compared to the yeah. way it used to be. And the wages are nothing the way that they were where uh, back in the 70s and 80s when steel workers could send their kids to college um, you know, on, on the money that they earned. So uh, I think it's dumb because of the timing. What do you think? Well, I think you're right. I think that you, know, I'm, I, you and I differ on protectionism. I am a free market guy. But in this instance, it's just like, you know, it's so late. I mean, I okay, let me just back up a second here and say I live in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham mm -hmm. was the Pittsburgh of the South. That's what was designed for that. It was, um, you know, that's that's what created it in 1871. Uh, big, you know, the big mules from up in P Pittsburgh said, well, we can have cheap. If you read the ads, they will make your jaw drop. You can have cheap white labor. <laughs> they had to make that distinction. White labor is the best labor. And they didn't have unions. Uh, so they could come down here and they're the ring of fire. You could go up to Red Mountain, which overlooks the city, and you could have the ring of fire. You could see all across from from hem, from, you know, uh, point to point, you had steel mills and you could see the flames from the forges burning away. Well, those all went away. There is one steel uh, plant left in the Birmingham area. It's pretty small by comparison. Uh, I, yeah, I have gone up through the Rust Belt in the last few years, and uh, you can see much bigger plants, much bigger catastrophes by not protecting American markets. This is why do it now? What's the point here, Ted? I mean, seriously. You got me. I don't care, right. Scott, at all. I mean, I think it's like, um, you know, it's maybe it's kind of like the Iranian drone attack, purely performative. I mean, you know, look, right now it is an election year. The president's trying to shore up his support with big labor. It's a little bit weak. Uh, maybe he's like, you know, look at me, I'm standing up for the workers. It might also be, it may be more meaningfully a way to tell the Chinese, stop fucking with us. You know, we're, we have this rivalry with you. We're going to lean on you. It's a bad move. And it's, you know, I don't feel any, I don't think there's anything to be gained by pissing off the Chinese. They're not looking to hurt us. They're just looking to rake in money. And this is like, you know, I mean, frankly, at this stage, if we can get cheap Chinese imports for steel, and it's not really competing against an American industry, because that American industry is gone and is never coming back, why not take it? So, yeah, in, and so in this particular sector, I am a free, I'm a free trader because I don't see, I just don't see the reason. There's no jobs to protect, you know? Well, also, it, it dovetails into a conversation real quick about um, the Biden administration and the billions of dollars they're throwing to try to resuscitate the American um, uh, uh, Intel chip, or not just Intel, is not just one of the companies, it's one of the companies, but the, uh, you know, the chip industry in this United States, all of which had been shipped out to China, to India, to Vietnam and other places. Um, I just, I have, again, I feel very uneasy trying to force feed an economy and trying to resuscitate an economy. As you mentioned, steel's not coming back. You're not going to all of a sudden, this Akron, like, Ohio, like the steel mills. Went, sorry to interrupt, Scott, but it, it's like, yeah. remember during the last campaign, Trump kept talking about, I'm going to bring back coal in 2016. He said that. And it's yeah. like in West Virginia, it's like, but, the, but, but no, there's no demand for it. No one wants coal. I mean, so it's like, the coal industry, you know, wasn't shivved or anything. It's just that, like, um, you know, the, the marketplace moved to other cleaner energy sources and, you know, and, and less clean, like fracking. Um, you know, I mean, they, it's just that's how it went. It's just a change in the business. Um, you know, it's the same sort of thing, I think. Yeah, I, look, we in, we're in complete agreement here. I think, look, it's Joe Biden weird. has, he, you know, the thing is, like, I'm sympathetic to Joe Biden's argument here, which is he's really between a rock and a hard place. Inflation. He has to, I mean, he can't like depress prices or we'll go into a depression. So, you know, all he could do is lower inflation, but that is, it, it's literally impossible to go back in time and reduce the very high inflation that followed the restart of the economy after the COVID lockdown. 
And that was inevitable that that was going to happen. I mean, you know, it was a very analogous situation to the end of World War I, which coincided with the lockdown of the Spanish flu pandemic. So you had a double kind of whammy, right? And consumer spending had been radically depressed from 1917 to 1921. And then the economy was a disaster. So when people started spending again, at that time, your, uh, you know, President Warren Harding, who I think you kind of admire, he was smart. Yeah, he, Coolidge. He was, he was like, uh, he was like, we're not going to stimulate the economy. Yeah. Yes. We don't think we need to. We think it'll all just come back by itself. And it did. It came back gangbusters. And in fact, there was a huge danger that the economy was going to overheat. And inflation did get really out of control. Both Harding and Coolidge decided, again, we're not going to do anything. The, the, we don't need to like cut. We don't need to rise, raise interest rates. The, the, you know, the, pent, pent up, the pent up demand will exhaust itself and things yeah. will even out. And they did until the stock market crash. Uh, so it, it was like this time, um, you know, Biden was very worried about the economy. So he overstimulated it. Um, and uh, when he when he came in with the Inflation Reduction Act, and ironically, um, and um, and so the inflation went w- way up high, but now that's done and there's nothing he can, he can't undo it. We can't go back to 2020 prices, but the American people remember 2020 prices and they want those prices back. So all you can really kind of do at this point, people will get used to the new prices, but it's going to take time. Will it happen by November? Maybe, maybe not. So that, so I, but I think where Biden could maybe do something um, would be with housing prices. I mean, the housing market's completely frozen because of high interest rates. There's no inventory. There's a major part, the homeless problem is in large part caused due to a lack of affordable housing. My idea, if he won't do it, but my big idea is okay. seize some of the 30 million abandoned homes in the United States that have been, I'm being abandoned, I mean, unoccupied for 20 years or more, boarded up, pieces of shit, no one's ever gonna live there. Seize them, turn that into affordable housing and housing for the formerly homeless. Like you will increase housing stock dramatically. That's going to make prices, housing affordable. Give those houses away for a song. Just have like, make it a WPA project. Basically, have people pay only the cost that, that a new federal, like maybe the FHA establishes a construction agency. Like if it costs $12,000 to build that house, you give it to people for $12,000, you know. Hmm. I guarantee you, you're going to be putting people in their starter homes. You're going to be revitalizing neighborhoods. It's going to, the, the houses that are around those houses, their values will go up. Local, lo, local tax collections will go up. It's going to revitalize the inner cities all over the country. This is the key. Interesting. No, I've, uh, that's a, I've thought about that a lot. You mentioned that uh, the other day when I was out there. You also mentioned on the podcast, the people's perception of infl- inflation, the lag time. That inflation is at 3%. It's not as horrible as it was coming out of the pandemic, but people don't see that. They see like me, they go and like, you know, I, I can't go out to lunch now for less than 50 bucks with my yeah. wife. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's got- the new reality. So at this point, success for Biden is like, if it's only $52 for you to go out to lunch with your wife by November, that's success. So that's yeah, but well, people see it, and I think you make that, and you make that valid point. Uh, you know, there's this lag time. It was a lag time for uh, George H. W. Bush in 1992. Yep. The economy was coming back after a the shallow election recession. Election was in '94. He would have won. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Ted Raw, and thanks again for last week for the hospitality. Where can we see all things Ted Raleigh in? please check out my uh, daily uh, show on Sputnik Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern, the final count. An excellent show, by the way. Angie Wong and frequently with you, Scott Stantis. Um, also, you watch it on X Spaces or Rumble or on Sputnik News. Uh, go to go whoatwhy.org on Saturdays. Look at my cartoons. Go to rawl.com. Go to gocomics.com slash Ted Rawl. And go to Center Clip for both you, Scott, and me to look at our mini podcast. Scott, where can we find all things Scott Stantis? You can go to gocomics.com slash Scott Stantis for my editorial cartoons, gocomics.com slash Prickly City. 
allegedly the Chicago Tribune is they just switched over to a new, um, you know, web page type thingy and lost my gallery. I'm not kidding. They can't find it anywhere. Same Interesting. People who, who, the same government agency who rebuilt the FAFSA. Obviously. Exactly. And, and gave you, know, you the Obamacare website. They found other galleries, interestingly enough, they just couldn't find mine. But uh, hopefully we'll get that up and running shortly. Um, and like Ted said, Center Clip, which I really love, and I can I do economic uh, discussions, which I adore, and we can talk politics. It's a real time, 30 seconds to no longer than five minutes. It's, it's an awesome platform, so I'm really happy. And Ted, again, la one last time, thank you so much for the hospitality. I just had a great time. Got to meet Clovis face to face. True. And, and I fear him now. And I, I worship him. I understand. Him. Like he is in charge yes. of everything. Yeah. He is. He is. Okay. All right. God bless well, him. With that, everyone, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Uh, see you every week or more often if news breaks. See ya. Bye.